Jeanette, <clears throat> Jeanette and Elizabeth, they're both in the videos. Hey, very welcome, Jeanette and Elizabeth. And uh, uh, we are going to start at 35, hoping that uh, uh, Rosa makes it on time. Uh, she is uh, very close. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, and getting here. So I will just uh, say a couple of uh, layperson explanations uh, uh, on, on, on definitions, and then and then we will get into specialist talks. Yes, okay. So let's get to Okay. Uh, yesterday you had a nice banner on sound. Ah, yeah, should we bring the banner? It looks like the memory span is bad. <laughs> 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 People stopping by the exhibit. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so people not too close. Yes. It's just fifty centimeters. I'll tell you. What, <clears throat> one of the one of the women in the video, Caroline. She, it was always been her dream to go to the United Nations. So when you do the walkthrough, you can see her on the video. She's just thrilled. <laughs> So, hello. I think that now it's really getting a bit late. So we should uh, we should start. Apologies for the delay. We were waiting for the in-person participant. Uh, hello from the rotunda here at the BIC in Vienna. Uh, it's a bit loud here, but it's also very exciting to see this exhibition. Uh, it is attracting a lot of attention. Uh, we have uh, uh, 
Sabine, why don't you share uh, your experience? Because Sabine, uh, she she was uh, I'm not prepared. <laughs> no, just to share what you what you have uh, talked uh, about with the visitors, because there were many visitors, and uh, Sabine was accompanying them. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, they the on many days, so they didn't know they were from different countries and they um, had a fact that uh, Canada or UK or the person where they came from, um, they uh, didn't really realize before that uh, it exists some thing that uh, like uh, like non-state torture. Um, it is not well known. Like, we always had to explain what it means. What it is. They uh, thought it's, it's only mutilation or it's only sexual abuse or just in one direction. It's all of that. And even more that it exists in families, it dropped. Uh, I think you can hear me all. That's better. Okay. So that were the main uh, feelings I heard from the visitors. And, uh, and it was very, very important uh, to, to have the possibility to have uh, someone like, uh, like Sabine so committed and uh, uh, able to uh, intercept the visitors uh, because uh, some uh, would hesitate uh, approaching uh, the tables. And so they, they needed, they, exactly, they, they, they were looking at the topic and uh, interested, but not really. Uh, uh, capable of uh, taking the initiative of, of, uh, of approaching on their own. And, and so thank you very much. I think that the to be I will let you more information. And we also have uh, here, uh, ah, here we have Eduardo, who has just arrived. Uh, we're going to prepare the speakers, but in the meantime, I will just complete the update. We have the QR codes, as you know, uh, and uh, if you scan the QR code, you can watch the entire video, the 45 minutes video. And we had uh, this morning when I checked uh, 167 views already. Uh, that makes uh, the video from the Alliance with the highest uh, uh, watching rate uh, in the first 24 hours. So it, it was uh, really, really, really uh, very interesting. So we are getting ready now. Thank you, Sabine. Okay. <laughs> so we have just... Uh, Sorry, so our speakers are here. Add a third for it. Yes, exactly. Can you still see me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we are. Hi, Linda. We are welcoming. Hi. I'm a bit wet. <laughs> <wet. laughs> the so, oven doesn't go here, so you have to be careful when you come. <laughs> while while Rosa relaxes a bit, and Eduardo can also Eduardo take a seat here. Uh, in the meantime, we have uh, a video that uh, we have uh, received uh, from uh, Linda Witong, and uh, uh, we can watch her video before we go to the uh, in-person discussion. So. Uh, to be asked, can you please play the of human rights, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly. The prohibition against torture is considered to be a core principle in human rights law. Torture was referred to as the plague of the second half of the 20th century. In an effort, effort to eliminate this plague, over the decades, UN human rights instruments, declarations, resolutions, and reports expressed a commitment to prevent and combat state torture in all its forms and manifestations. 
Yet in spite of the prohibition of torture and ill treatment itself, the vast majority of those responsible for perpetrating, instigating, consenting, or acquiescing to torture or ill treatment were still not being held to account. Torture and other forms of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment were still rampant in most, if not all, parts of the world. Why was that? It had to do with methods of control and implementation. Steps taken by the mandate to combat torture had focused almost entirely on states as potential perpetrators. Yet organized crime, terrorist organized armed groups, private military and security contractors, mercenaries, foreign fighters, and other non-state actors, including private parties who had created their own private chamber of horrors, were increasingly engaged in conduct that concluded torture and other cruel inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. For the absolute and non-derogable prohibition of torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, to retain its practical relevance, it has to also provide for practical protection against violations on the part of these non-state actors. However, at present, with a few exceptions, the UN Convention Against Torture does not include practical protection against such violations on the part of non-state actors. The right to be free from torture and other forms of physical and mental treatment is absolute and must not be suspended or restricted under any circumstances. We must ensure that acts of torture are criminal and unjustifiable, regardless of their motivation, wherever, whenever, and by whomever they are committed. UN experts agree, in view of the pervasive of armed non-state actors, as well as non-armed state actors' involvement worldwide during conflict and other situations of violence, it is imperative that existing international legal protections be effectively implemented to safeguard the human rights of individuals and groups, irrespective of the status or character of the perpetrators. Victims must be in a position to seek redress violations or abuses of their rights, regardless of who the actors are. Please help us stop this plague. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Linda. I don't know if she's not online because uh, it's very early where she is. Um, we have heard exactly what uh, we, we need to know. So we need to know that uh, uh, for the time being, everything that has to do with uh, torture in the UN instruments relates to state actors. So that's why we have a need now to promote this concept that for some is a bit, a bit strange. What does it mean, no state and, and this is why we need this type of discussion where uh, we need to, to unpack the fact that no state torture is a human rights issue. And it's a so this is what we are going to discuss today. And I would like to give the floor to Rosa. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I thank all the sponsors, and especially the government of Honduras, for hosting this event. It's a very important event. Um, I've been working in the in the field of preventing violence against women and domestic violence uh, all my professional life. I continue to do that. I have been uh, part of the drafting committee of the so-called Istanbul Convention uh, against violence against women, domestic violence, and also served as a member on the monitoring committee for four years to, to implement it. And I have to say, I have learned a lot from Chi and, and Linda, uh, because, you know, domestic violence uh, sounds uh, rather not so serious, <laughs> I could say, yeah. But we know that behind it, there are serious forms of human rights violation violation which resemble torture. I have learned that through your important work that we really have to take that seriously and that actually most domestic violence goes over years. It often uh, involves children uh, and it goes unnoticed. And I want to tell a little story about two girls who I happen to meet uh, through my work. Their father works for an international organization 
and uh, the mother was abused by him and she tried to flee from the violence. And through the, through the um, uh, hate convention, the abusive mother managed to get the girl back to, back to him and the judges unfortunately gave him the sole custody. So these two girls had all the childhood had to live with the abusive mother because the violence was sidelined, wasn't regarded. And they experienced physical violence with the belt, they experienced sexual violence. They went to an international school, nobody knew about the problem, uh, and they had to wait until, unfortunately, until they were big enough to say, stop, we're not going back to you. And it's so important that we have that recognized in the human rights framework, because these victims are suffering in violence. They are our, our colleagues, our friends, our neighbors, our families. And uh, it's, it's very important that the system believes the victims, that they, they, they it's very easy for most users have lawyers, they have, they have expensive lawyers, they can afford them, and the victims are standing with empty hands. So to do justice to, to the victims, we have to introduce that into our system. Our system, our criminal justice system, the human rights system has to stand on the side of the victim and not on the side of the abuser. It's a very, uh, very serious problem, very, um, very difficult to address in the justice system. And we have to be very clear which side we are on. So thank you for your initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, for these very uh, powerful words. Uh, it is uh, um, we are here. Pardon, this is the end of crime prevention and criminal justice. So we have uh, Geneva, the human rights. Uh, we have the General Assembly in New York. How do we connect the? Uh, all these environments to make sure that, that, that we recognize this as additional human rights and the uh, As I mentioned yesterday, there are a number of uh, uh, possible options to explore. Uh, uh, however, I think that the most important thing, and this is why it's important, that this kind of uh, exercise, this kind of events that uh, try to uh, Increase uh, public awareness. Uh, of, of thing. What is important is really to enlist uh, uh, the interest and the action on the part of member states, because basically those are the ones who have to start setting the act in motion in order to take proper initiatives, whether it is Vienna, whether it is. Uh, Geneva, whether it is New York. Uh, so I, this is why I think that, that events and occasions like this in which it is possible to uh, raise awareness and raise awareness on a global level, uh, uh, try to identify possible uh, countries, uh, member states, uh, experts for these member states who can push their uh, colleagues, uh, government officials, to uh, take the matter seriously and try to do something better than uh, what it is now is extremely important. Now, we mentioned the importance uh, uh, of uh, victims and uh, what we can do for them. Let's not forget that since 1985, there is a United Nations Declaration on Justice for Victims of Crime and abuse of power. It was recommended for adoption by the United Nations Congress on the Prevention of Crime and the Treatment of Offenders at the time, held in Milan, uh, and it was adopted the same year by the General Assembly. Quite a lot has been done in, in order to look at the implementation of this declaration, but in my view, absolutely not enough. So I think that uh, uh, we should uh, probably try to do something more. There are a number of others, uh, uh, UN standards, including uh, uh, several resolutions for domestic violence, uh, not to speak the other one on uh, uh, gender uh, based violence, uh, which I mentioned yesterday, as a possible follow up. 
particularly in view of the recent, most recent uh, recommendation of the third committee of an overall resolution on, uh, on, uh, on gender violence, uh, which uh, for the first time also tried to the language, femicide, etc. So I think that uh, this would be a source of inspiration for interested member states to look at this matter in a different way and uh, to decide. I think one does not exclude the others. Any forum would be good in order to continue the discussion, in order to see uh, how is it possible to involve uh, additional countries uh, in this, so as uh, take initiatives that at the end can be crowned by, by success. Still, some forums in the UN work by consensus, so this is extremely important when all countries on the side, all the forums are uh, working by voting. Uh, uh, for example, for example, if consensus is not possible to reach at the end of the vote, it is clear, however, that uh, uh, if you were voted, there might be always uh, the possibility of interested uh, or concerned member states that are going to put uh, their position uh, in connection with the lack of information, which contains language. So I think that all these are elements that should be considered. Um, and uh, of course, uh, 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 we depend very much at the end on uh, uh, what uh, the entire international, as well as civil societies, is extremely important. There is awareness, which is why the raised interest and action on the part of member states at the end is an extremely important thing. And this is why we are grateful to the government of uh, Honduras, uh, Finland, etc., who have uh, sponsored this kind of uh, initiatives. Indeed, no, thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, we have here a, a double entry point. See, so on the one hand, uh, uh, there is this uh, push that uh, we also heard uh, uh, from uh, former special reporters on torture to, to include the non-state actors in the, in the torture frame, the rights framework on torture. And then the other end, we have gender-based markets. So really, the recognition of these forms of violence that are based on gender. So, Rosa, what do you think about this double entry point? Yeah, it's good to have double entry points, I think. And uh, I think it's really, it's really important to recognize it on both sides. As I said, I mean, I, I'm working in gender-based violence, violence against women. I know also Honduras has specific measures on this issue, and I've, I've studied that. Uh, um, uh, but, but as I said, I mean, because domestic violence has been uh, seen not really as violence for so long. I mean, the police are saying, oh, it's only a domestic. They say, oh, it's only a domestic. And, uh, and so there is still, we are kind of mini, still minimalizing. Uh, and and we don't. I mean, we know from, from some extreme cases. There's also in Austria happened extreme cases, as you know. I mean, uh, uh, women locked up uh, in, in the for yes. years. Yeah. I mean, these are extreme cases. We don't know how many of these extreme cases there are, but there are other cases who are also extreme, but maybe not so spectacular. And and I think we have to really recognize that. I mean, it is torture to live in permanent threat of violence. It is torture. And so I'm very grateful to, to use that. I mean, it's this non-state torture. And I think it has to show up specifically in documents as a term so that it raises our awareness that this is not just a slap. I mean, a slap is bad enough. No, but this is this is it's really serious, traumatizing. It it's it for all your life and for generations. So I I I think the double entry points should both be used to raise awareness for that. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, we have only the two uh, main uh, substantive contributors to uh, our working group, uh, uh, Jim Sarson and Lincoln McDonald. Would you like to comment on, on this discussion? Jim. Uh, sometimes I can hear every what you're saying. Sometimes I can't. So if I misrepresent uh, anything, just let me know. But what's coming to me so much when I read um, a paper or an article, it often says abuse and violence. So what does violence mean? And this is what, for me, the exhibit is doing. It's defining a form of violence, in this case, non-state torture. And if you go through the exhibit, it's telling you about the crime. It's telling you how the perpetrators commit the crime, what the impact of this specific type of crime is. And um, like Rosa said, there are so often violence that is in the family or in relationships is minimized or trivialized and just tossed aside um, instead of looking at what the meaning of the word, what type of violence is being impacted uh, against uh, women and children in this case. And I know there are some men too who will suffer uh, non-state torture but predominantly women and children and little girls, especially around the sexualized uh, torture. Um, so that's what I would add that's so important is that we don't gloss over the word violence. We have to break that down to understand what the perpetrators do, the impact on those that they torture and the impact uh, that could be lifelong. So I would add that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to say, um, well, maybe you don't want me to talk yet, uh, do you? Yeah, okay. If you look at the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, it said no one in Article 5, no one shall be subjected to torture. That's how we started in the 40s. And then by the 80s, we had the Committee Against Torture and the convention, but women were forgotten. They weren't in the no one, women and children. It, was, it really should have said men should not be subjected to torture because that's honestly what happened. So here we are trying to push all these years, 30 some years to get women understood and girls understood. And it's important what Sabina said that people coming to the display have no idea how much torture happens in families or in personal relationships, whether it's your husband or you know uh, your boss or human trafficker or in prostitution or in pornography. Women and girls are just invisible in that reality of torture. And we have to start reframing the word torture to understand that it's not just something that happens to men. And if we can have a format where survivors can come and share their stories, we have the videos there, but I feel that some of the member states need to meet the women and sit down with them and they have to tell their stories to them. And be it becomes real to you when you start hearing the detail of what torture is. It, it could never be called abuse if you've been raped 20,000 times in your, in your life from the time you're born till you're 25. That's just never, ever, ever abuse. So we have to stop forgetting about the women and the girls. That's remember that this is a, a reality for all of us, torture in the in the world. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ginny and Linda. And uh, Rosa, would you like to say something? Ah, I, I think it's, I mean, I'm 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 really grateful that you continue to do that because it's it's a it's hard work. Because uh, uh, people think we have all the we have all the, the framework, the legal framework, and we have everything. I mean, there's we've we've been talking about it for decades, as you say, but it it didn't really sink in. It didn't really sink into us what it does to our societies. I mean, it's it's basically destroying the fundament of our society because you can't trust. 
you, you, you can trust people. And it's, 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 I think it's, it's our communities that are ill from this. Is sick. They, you can see it in other problems also, uh, and and uh, I mean, of course, the, the the perpetrators also commit other violence outside of the. They are not torturing only inside. Yeah, and uh, so I think we have to aware that this is a terrible illness, and and we have to do everything, everything, and much more uh, to to stop it, because we kind of we kind of have learned to live with it. But we shouldn't. We shouldn't learn to live with it. We shouldn't think this is normal. It is not normal. It's inhuman. And that's why I think it's so very, very valuable to continue with this um, work. Thank you very much. I can uh, ensure the commitment of the alliance. Uh, we can establish this working group. We are already planning the next uh, event on the 7th of December. And uh, uh, we want to bring this to the Crime Commission next uh, May. So we are advancing this work and uh, through all these uh, uh, different inputs and, as I said, different entry points, uh, we really hope to have something concrete that we can share with member states for them to absorb and uh, uh, move uh, forward. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers. And um, we will see each other tomorrow for uh, some closing considerations. Uh, thank you very much, Jean and Nita. Thank you for all those uh, who attended, Inge, Jeanette, and Francesca. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a new day, like Eduardo said. It's a new beginning. So this is good. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and we're not we're, we're not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs>